presentation we'll be looking at some of the key mobile trends uh, that I think will be interesting for you both as students of an e-learning course also as business management students. Um, so it will be kind of a brief overview of some of the most interesting things that are going on right now in the mobile space. Uh, but first, if you're not yet convinced why you should even care about these things, uh, things or why is mobile even interesting, um, well, because some smart people think it is. No, okay. Um, well, actually, mobile devices are becoming increasingly popular and increasingly <laughs> also um, user-friendly. They're not just little bricks we use to make phone calls or, or send text messages. They're really portable computers uh, that can do almost as much as, I don't know, desktop computers or even laptops. Uh, so what we'll be talking about here today is mobile devices that are we can find by, um, you know, modern smartphones, uh, even things like the iPod Touch, uh, tablet computers, the iPads, so we're talking about really this um, new generation of um, post-PC devices that are portable, uh, that we usually interact through touch interfaces, so that sort of thing. So without further ado, we do have a lot of things to cover. Let's take a look at the five key trends. Uh, and basically in the next hour I'll just throw a bunch of ideas, a bunch of different things that are going on on the table. So let's jump right in. The first trend I kind of chose to highlight today uh, is the trend of how mobile devices are transforming learning. Well, it's obvious why I chose this um, trend because as you all, all know you're taking the e-learning course so it's only fitting that uh, we say something about that as well. And um, I think you, you already learned um, a lot of things uh, during this cor uh, the course about how e-learning works. Um, and you're probably also fans of e-learning. You know that we have, we've had e-learning for a long time now, and it's pretty cool because you, have, you get interactive materials that you can click through. Um, it's really awesome because it's adaptable, it can adjust to your learning style, it can adjust to your pace, and it can also give you instant feedback, which is something we all love uh, and we don't have, for, uh, we don't get with traditional textbooks, for example. So traditional e-learning is already great, and mobile learning isn't really all that different because it builds on all of the advantages that e-learning already provides us. Uh, but it does provide us with that little something, something extra. Uh, that I like to call magic uh, because it's not you know just hyperlinked content that's adjustable that gives you instant feedback but uh, it's also especially these mobile new mobile devices provide us a new way to interact with our content to touch to special sensors that can tell you know I don't know where I am like the GPS uh, sensor they know where I am um, how my device oriented and all that uh, kind of stuff. And so, in a way, the <coughs> characteristics of these devices are um, influencing how um, mobile learning works. And um, But let's not just talk about this, let's to, uh, look at a few examples. Uh, so first example, I have a short video here that introduces an interesting iPad app called Our Choice. Uh, that kind of, I think it's a good example of what we can expect from textbooks in the future. Um, so it's kind of a unique book, as you will see, but I think that in a couple of years, a lot of the, book, the books we'll be using to study will look like this. So let's take a look. You can see it's a whole different way of interacting with content. We can really touch it. And another cool thing about this kind of content is that you don't really have to learn anything new to be able to pick up a book like this and study. Uh, if you, I don't know, take a person who's never used a computer, you have to explain a lot to them how to use this thing, you know, how to click, double click, right click, all the sort of things. With this 
touch device is the iPad, for instance, you can give it to your grandma and she'll love it from the first moment because you really won't have to explain what to do. She'll know I touch this, something happens, and uh, I think it will make her quite happy. Um, let's take a look, a look at another interesting example. Uh, this is an app, also an iPad app um, called Evernote Pick. And it's kind of a system that helps you uh, revise your materials. So it's kind of an app that allows you to review uh, your content using uh, flashcards. So let's take a look. It's really making the learning experience, the electronic learning experience, much more physical. Because this app specifically is using the smart cover uh, for the iPad 2. We can play with it a bit later if you never experienced it. Uh, but basically, this cover has magnets, so the iPad uh, knows whether the cover is over the screen or not. And when, uh, whenever you open the cover, it wakes from sleep. So this app uses this fact, and it's really a different way to interact. So is it a special yeah. cover that yeah. it's... Uh, I have it here, so uh, we can play with it later. You'll see, it's really an incredible how does it, experience. How, what's the name of it? Uh, it's a smart cover. Small. For, uh, but it's built specifically for the iPhone 2 because oh, the iPhone yeah, <laughs> No, but I, but I don't have to. I have uh -huh. Yeah, it won't work. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a really interesting convention. And I think it's, while for now, you know, it's specific for one device, it also shows kind of directions also these devices will be taking. You know, not just, you know, the device itself, but also all these accessories that can make it uh, so much better. Uh, for instance, I know we were talking about Prezi earlier, the presentation software. Uh, there's also an app on the iPad for Prezi that allows you to interact with your Prezi presentations uh, with touch. So not only you can advance slides, slides, next, uh, back, and so on, but you can really touch it, rotate it, pinch to zoom. Um, so we can also take a look at that app later on if you'll be interested. Um, so we see, you know, mobile devices are really transforming, transforming learning in a magical way. Uh, but there's a bigger trend behind this, and uh, it's the trend of um, or phenomena of the apps, the applications that run on these mobile devices. And with that, um, there's also you know, the phenomena of the app stores, uh, the application stores that sell these applications for mobile devices. Uh, so I don't know if you know that, but um, currently there are two major application stores for mobile devices. Uh, the biggest one is Apple's App Store, uh, that sells applications for iPhones, iPod Touches, and iPads. And as you can see, it really has some impressive numbers, already over uh, 400,000 apps. Uh, the second big biggest is the Google Android market that sells applications for Android stores. Uh, a bit smaller, but also uh, quite impressive numbers. And basically, nowadays, you can find an app for pretty much everything. Uh, you name an interest, I think we'll find an app in the App Store that will um, help you do something better or um, get to know something new. Uh, and so, you know, the question is, you know, why are these apps so popular and why everybody is talking about this? And one of the reasons um, for the success of apps, apart you know, for, from the fact that uh, they provide quite a unique experience, as we already saw, is that they have a really interesting distribution channel, the application stores. And the application stores um, really work because they provide a better user experience for the customers. Um, and it's you know something quite new if you think about how you discover or buy or even install new software for your laptops, for instance. It's a mess. You have to find a website to download the software, or you have to go to a physical store and grab the DVD. Um, so it's really not easy. It's not friendly. The software is also quite expensive, usually. So the application stores really try to make this uh, a bit different. And first of all, you know, the application store provides one place for all your app, apps. So if you have an iPhone and want an app, you 
have one place to go. It's the App Store, it's right there on your phone, and it's very easy to use. Also, an interesting, um, and it also adds recommendations and user reviews. So you can see what other people think of it. You also have editors that recommend you apps. So it's really a system that's built um, in such a way that it encourages you to discover new apps and uh, to buy new apps. Also, Apple had a really um, smart idea to, when they released the iPhone and later on the App Store, to tie it to the existing iTunes Store that they already had. So you probably know the iTunes Store. You can buy music there, even movies and so on. And um, for instance, Apple already had millions of customers that were using the iTunes stores, Store um, no, knew how it worked and they had also their credit card info tied to their accounts. So when they released the iPhone and the apps, all the data said, okay, so here is your iTunes, you already knew, know how to use that, and now with the same account you can buy also apps. And for the user it couldn't be simpler. So that's one of the um, most important reasons why it works. Uh, plus the apps are easier to manage, uh, especially compared to existing, uh, to how we manage apps and software. You know, when you buy a new computer and you want to have Microsoft Word on it, you have to dig for that CD, uh, office CD that you have somewhere in your closet and it's a hassle, it takes a long time. With the App Store, everything is easier because, you know, you have an account, the App Store knows it's you, knows you already bought the apps, so when you connect a new device or when you have to, um, I don't know, um, start fresh, um, it's easy to transfer all your apps to your devices. Plus, it also enables you to update really easily. You usually have push notifications that tell you your apps can update, you want to update, and you say yes and all your uh, apps are updated in about a minute. So it's really convenient for the user. Um, and I'm pretty sure you've already heard of the App Store uh, or the uh, Google Android market, but it's interesting now that it, kinda, it seems like everyone wants an App Store suddenly. Um, for instance, Amazon, you know, Amazon, the biggest online retailer, is now selling Android apps, and it's kind of an alternative to the Google Android market. Uh, then Google also has the Chrome Web Store for selling browser apps, uh, extensions, and themes. And Apple is also, you know, because they had such a huge success with the uh, mobile application store, is um, they also launched the Mac App Store. So if you're using a Mac, um, there's also an App Store, and you buy uh, apps in the same way as you do for your mobile devices. Um, so really, everyone wants an app store. And why is that? Huh. Well, guess what? Money, money. Uh, app stores are actually quite good for business, it turns out. Um, an interesting um, info or fact is that Apple paid out uh, um, already two, uh, two and a half billion dollars to developers, so to people and companies who make apps uh, for their mobile devices, so the iPads and iPhone. So that's a lot of money, but you know, an important side note here is that the company that owns the App Store, of course, takes a cut from every purchase. So when you buy an iPhone app, you also give 30% to Apple. Similarly, when you buy an Android app um, on the Google, mar uh, Google market, something goes to Google as well. Um, so usually, you know, the companies that have these app stores uh, take around 30% uh, of the price. Um, and that's kind of becoming a standard uh, in the industry. Um, although, you know, don't think that Apple and Google are now making a lot of, lot of money already from the app store because it also takes a lot of uh, resources to run an app store. But it's still an interesting revenue source. And it also, of course, increases the, va the value of your devices because Apple, whenever they're selling the iPhone, they say you have 44, uh, 400,000 ways of making your iPhone better. It's great. You know, you don't buy just the phone as it is, but you can, you have a great choice selection of apps that can make it even better. 
Um, and now as um, business and management students, um, I think it's an interesting question for you um, also. How do you, people who develop this, uh, these apps make money? So how are those two and a half billion dollars made? Well, there are two obvious answers, I think, uh, that we know also from um, the web. So one is you sell your app in the app store, so you require users to pay you something before they can use your app, or you can give your app for free, but you have ads that annoy the user. Uh, and of course, then you give them the option, you know, if you, you don't want those annoying ads, well, just buy the full version. Um, so those are, you know, two pretty standard, standard uh, business models when it, when it comes to software or um, internet content as well. But there are also two other mm -hmm. options of how you can get revenue from apps. And one is uh, the in-app purchase option, which it means that you're selling digital content through your app. And that's usually content that kind of enhances the user experience uh, in the app, provides some additional content. Or you know, you can also sell digital subscriptions that's especially interesting for publishers. So magazines, they give you, you know, their basic app for free. But if you want to get regular content, quality content, you have to subscribe. Um, but that's, you know, we already know that they, they also say sell uh, print subscriptions in a similar way. So um, I think what's really interesting is that the model of selling in-app purchases, um, for instance, an example uh, from, our, from an app. TapTap Revenge is a uh, uh, mobile app that allows you to tap um, in the rhythm of your favorite songs on your mobile phone or in, on tablet. So I see you're nodding. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty fun, you know, because it's, uh, it's quite a challenge. You get to listen to your favorite music. Um, it's a pretty cool app. And uh, at first, uh, the app wasn't free. They were charging it a couple of dollars. But then they said, OK, not a lot of people were really willing to spend a couple of do dollars up front. So what we're going to do is offer the app for free and include some basic songs with it. But if people want to play you know, the top hits, those really popular songs, well, you got to pay for it. So in the app, you know, whenever you run out of the songs to play or you see you know, your favorite artist and you don't have the song, you can just you know, click to buy an additional song. Um, so it's a really interesting model. And of course, you know, Apple gets a cut from this too. Yes. I have an example. So I think it's a good example. Uh, the gaming community is a great spender. Mm. The World of Warcraft, you know, the application, they were paying from the start. But now I think with uh, a lot of competition, they're starting to uh, pay from the 20th level up. Yeah. So you get to a certain level, and then when you want more, you have to pay. Yeah, World of Warcraft is especially interesting because they also have other examples. For instance, in World of Warcraft, if you have, want to have some fancy vanity items, like a fancy shiny horse, you have to pay $20 for it. And yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's really pretty. It's, pretty. it's made out of stars. But, yeah. you have, uh, but can you download it and install it? You know what it? Uh, it's like a program with, uh, that you don't have like to pay. It's like a hacker. Like yeah, like a hacker. Yeah. Um, well, Yes. Uh, also, you know, when we're talking ab about app stores, there are back doors as well. You can jailbreak your device and get everything for free. Yeah. So I here we're, yeah, we did. Here we're <laughs> talking about the official legal. channels <laughs> and how okay. you know people are making money. Because yeah, the jailbreak community, of course, and hacks are part of basically anything that's on the internet. Yeah. Also, of course, world work if you can you can play on uh, illegal servers that people set up uh, on their own. Uh, but you don't get the same community uh, that you do when you pay. Um, so, but of course, you know, there's always a bank door <laughs> somewhere. Uh, so we'll focus on the legal. I don't want legal. Any, <laughs> yeah, I don't want any lawsuits here. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, so yeah, in-app purchase is a very interesting model. And what's uh, also very interesting is that, again, Apple saw this really works. You know, people love the fact that they can get an app for free and then only buy what the extras they need. 
So um, the next release of their um, desktop operating system, the Mac OS X, is will also include the option to include in-app purchases <coughs> into desktop software. So imagine you have, I don't know, a um, word processor uh, on your desktop and you can download it for free, but if you want fancy templates that look really great, you have to buy them for a dollar per tool. So it's an interesting model that's spreading kind of, not just, um, it's not, limited anymore to the mobile space, it's also it's spreading. And of course gaming was an important drive in this because also games, social games, for example, you know, Farmville, you probably know it in Facebook, they also use the same trick. The game is free to play, but if you want your crops to grow faster, if you want to harvest more, you have to pay for it <laughs> in real money. Uh, and it turns out, you know, most people won't pay anything but a large enough percentage of people will pay if uh, the game or the items you are selling provide enough value for them. I had the same experience, like, as you stole $20 that you bought that game. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> with the farm oil, I was like one month addicted to it. I, I didn't study, I didn't do anything, you know, all the time, Facebook, farm oil, Facebook, farm oil. So it was an offer in my country, not in my country, but in Albania. So. Uh, with telephone to buy uh, credits, credits and to uh, grow faster the carbs. So I did it, but yeah, you know, maybe I, I spent maybe 20, 20 euros mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't get the carbs to grow. So, because <laughs> I had the official license to, you know, the huh. in my country, yeah. my number couldn't do the mm. growing. So, yeah, yeah. I also bought farming. <laughs> I wanted to get. Some Christmas gifts for friends. Yeah. Fans. So it's not it wasn't for me, but I wanted to get them something really fancy. So. <laughs> so most of the money you spend on these things. Right? Yeah, but I, I'm not playing Carmel yet uh, anymore. Anymore. Uh, also, I keep my World of Warcraft addiction, so um, I'm not just buying apps in the app store. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, you see, you know, this, some of these trends are really also starting to influence. Um, other things, you know, they're not limited to mobile devices only. And what another big trend, trend we're seeing is that websites and our desktop are changing because of um, mobile devices and because companies that make mobile devices have learned new lessons. Um, <coughs> one thing that's also important to note, and it's a wider trend uh, that's it's going to be quite important is um, that the web itself, itself is also changing because we have all these new um, technolo web technologies that allow us to do more advanced things on the web. Uh, for instance, I don't know if you heard yet of um, HTML5 and mm -hmm. CSS3. So these are new web technologies um, that kind of upgrade what uh, we can already do on the web and allow us to do things like provide offline access for web services. For instance, um, they provide be better support for video playback. Um, they can also allow web designers to um, do um, a story or files and so on. And if you look at some of the HTML5 sites, um, I include an example, so um, the slides will of course be online so we can click on all these links later on. Um, and when you look at these sites, it, they really look like they were made in Flash, but they're not. It's pure web technology um, and it's, that also means it's easier for people to develop. Uh, because, you know, we were already talking, there are a lot of different mobile devices, a lot of different app stores. And now, when somebody you know wants to make um, a mobile app, you have the dilemma first. You know, should I go for Apple's platform? Should I start developing developing for Android first? Should I support both? For instance, imagine that you know your school would like to offer um, you as students a mobile app. You know, and they'll have they'll have to figure out. Uh, what pla platforms you as students are using and then you know make a choice and um, Increasingly, you know a lot of companies schools will want to support everyone 
but developing for even you know two major plot platforms such as uh, Apple's iOS and Android takes a lot of effort and money. So this is also where these web technologies can come in handy. Um, if you know we move from the tech talk, what this really means is that um, we can have websites that can behave more like apps. So you know you probably all know how websites work right now. You have to be online. Um, there's a certain way we're used to making websites and so on. And when you get a mobile app, it's a really a whole another experience. But people, you know, want that in their browsers. And technologies like HTML5 is um, has the potential to enable that. Plus, there are really potential, a lot of potential development time and cost savings that you get because you develop your app once for the browser and it can work on the iPad, on an Android a tablet, on any smartphone. So it's really quite convenient. Uh, plus, you know, you can avoid uh, giving Apple or Google some of the money when you are trying to sell a company because you don't have to go to the app stores to sell your stuff. Um, and I know this might sound a bit abstract right now, so let's take a look at an example. An example. Um, and it's uh, the new Financial Times web app. Uh, you probably know, all know Financial Times, and they already had apps for different platforms, for different devices. But, you know, as I said, they, you know, came to a point where they said, okay, this is costing us a lot of money, we have to support so many different devices, so why don't we try something different? And their different answer was to develop for uh, the web browser. So it's an app that lives in a web browser. Uh, let's take a look at the short video. It looks like it's an app built specifically for their device, but in, really, uh, uh, in fact it is a website. It just behaves like an app. You can also use it offline, um, and the experience is quite great. Uh, plus, you know, they can also sell, uh, sell subscriptions uh, to the magazine and not give Apple a cent. Uh, and it's, um, I think this, this trend will be quite important in the future. There's also quite a loud rumor going around that Facebook is also planning something similar. Um, an HTML5 platform that will give you an app experience um, from the browser. So it's certainly something we should all keep an eye on. Um, and then, you know, there's also the fact that, or the kind of trend that we're no noticing is that because um, designers in general, you know, have now the experience of designing for the smaller interactive touch-based devices, also, web design is changing because um, there are not so many devices out there, and people just you know want to provide the same uh, experience also on websites. So we're also seeing a lot of websites that look like they were made for tablets, uh, as if they were apps. Um, and also, when it comes to web design, we're also starting to see the trend of responsive design. Um, and kind of there's a wish that you know we should start building websites that will know how to adjust to different screen sizes and different devices on their own. So for the user, you know, you'll have a similar experience whether you're uh, looking at a website on a big screen, on a smaller screen, on a tablet, on a seven-inch tablet that's you know a whole different format because the site will know exactly um, your orientation how many pixels uh, it, it has to display the content and it will adjust accordingly. Uh, so that's also an interesting trend, um, kind of we can call it smarter websites that know how to adjust to uh, the device they're being viewed on. Uh, but we're also seeing that both Apple and Microsoft, Microsoft who both have uh, smartphone operating systems, are taking what they've learned uh, on their mobile devices and bringing them to their desktop operating systems. I already mentioned Mac OS X line. It's being released um, hopefully next week. Uh, and it basically is starting to look a lot like, for instance, iOS on the iPad. 
You have, for instance, the yeah. app launcher. It looks exactly like, this, like the same. Also, apps are uh, becoming full screen, so you, you know you don't have to view your docs on your desktop, whatever. It's just the app. The same experience as they have on the tablet. And also, they're really uh, providing support for touch gestures in their desktop operating system. Um, and you can use touch gestures with your desktop computer, uh, either with the trackpad, trackpad that you have on laptops, and Apple is also making a special uh, uh, square trackpad that can, you can buy even for your desktop that doesn't uh, have a trackpad. So it's really interesting, but um, we, we all know Apple likes to do, you know, cutting edge stuff. So I was more surprised when I saw the announcement for Windows 8, the next release of Windows. And they're also taking, you know, kind of the look and feel of the experience and bringing it to the desktop. So you also have, in Windows 8, you'll have also full screen apps, lots of touch gestures, you'll be able to swipe. Uh, flick through screens. Um, it's really interesting. So I don't think you know we'll be able to avoid this trend. Um, maybe if you if you stay with uh, Linux. Uh, but Apple and Microsoft apparently are both convinced that this is the way to go, and uh, that we should also make our desktops more like our mobile devices by simplifying them, by providing a more ex immersive experience, and providing support for touch. So touch is also an important piece of the puzzle. Okay, um, so we now looked at three really broad um, kind of trends. Uh, how mobile devices are influencing learning, uh, the phenomenon of the apps and the app stores, and how mobile devices and apps are influencing websites and desktops. So now we come to a um, really interesting trend, a bit more specific, and it's the trend of basically adding location to all sorts of uh, different services. And it's um, this is a really huge deal. I mean, we could have a whole other lecture dedicated just to location services. So we'll just go briefly to uh, to some of the examples of the most interesting services. So. Mm. Location, of course, is very interesting for mobile devices because unlike, you know, laptops, we have our phones with us wherever we go. If you go out to wire with your friends, you're probably not bringing your laptop with you, but I'm pretty sure you have your mobile phone with you. Um, so the way we use mobile devices is different from the way we use uh, the web uh, and the kind of things we want to do on mobile devices different from the kind of things we do on the desktops. Um, so a trend that Google, you know, the search giant is seeing is that uh, mobile search is really growing fast. Um, as you can see, comparable to the early days of desktop search. So they're really working hard on um, in improving the experience uh, that users have when searching on mobile phones. because. The things we uh, search for on mobile phones when you're out are different from what we search on um, when we're home. So an interesting example of a service they recently added to their mobile local search um, is an interesting approach of how they can make uh, finding nearby things easier. So um, let's take a look at a brief video. They really want to make uh, what you need on your mobile phone easier to find. It's you know just one tap, I'm hungry, I want to find a good restaurant. You also have get user reviews right there. Um, directions if you're um, in a city you don't really know. Um, yeah. So you still need to use internet or wireless to do this? Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, for now. For now, yeah. <laughs> Maybe the next Version it's not the HTML yeah. And the yeah, this is not uh, HTML5 yet, so it's <laughs> all online on the fly. Um, uh, and you know, um, here we see an example of how they make uh, finding things nearby easier. Uh, but they also have another interesting service called uh, Google Goggles. If you've heard of it, 
Um, and it might help you find uh, things on your mobile phone easier without having to type. Because we all know when you're outside and you're with your mobile phone, you're most probably walking on the street, um, lots of traffic around, and it's really annoying if you have to type out what you're looking for and what you need. So Google is doing some really uh, interesting things with Google Logos, also voice search. Um, and I recommend we take a look at the short video that um, kind of showcases different use cases. As you can see, a great example of how you know technology is slowly getting out of the way and just you know helping us do things we really need better. Especially on mobile devices when we're outside, you know, we don't have a lot of time to waste. We want info right there uh, where we are. And you know, if we can search just by taking a photo of a uh, thing or you know using voice search, it's great. Uh, and by the way, this video is for the iPhone app, but of course it's also available for Android. Just the video they made for uh, iPhone is actually a bit better than the video they did for Android, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to make you all buy iPhones. <laughs> um, okay, so um, yeah, location, as you can see, it's really important. Um, when we're out, you know, there's a lot of uh, different things that uh, mobile devices can help us uh, do better. Another big trend in the area of location services is um, location-based services like Foursquare. Now, how many of you know Foursquare? Okay. <laughs> so I guess we're the only ones using it. <laughs> Okay, so um, Foursquare, it's a simple service basically. It's um, either you can use it as an app or even on a mobile site that works on even future, future phones. So um, as long as you have data connection, you can use Foursquare. And basically you, um, you can get a list of all, your, of all the places nearby and then you can decide to check in at a place. So in, by checking in, you tell everyone or just your friends that you're at a certain place. So for instance, where, when, when uh, I arrived today at uh, the school, I checked in Foursquare and told my friends I'm here and I'm doing a lecture. So that's my friends uh, know I'm here. And for instance, if one of my friends is also in Copper today, uh, he'll see that and say, oh, we're in the same city, um, okay. let's grab a coffee. And you can also share tips um, when you check in. So for instance, if you're at a great restaurant and they have, um, I don't know, really great pizzas, you can leave a tip for that place saying you should all try their pizzas, they're the best. Um, so it's kind of, you know, sharing content related to location. You can also snap photos and so on. Um, and so of course, yeah. Is it like a chat, yeah? I don't know. I mean a messenger or something like that? Um, it's, it's not totally chat, uh, because you just, um, you check in and you tell your friends I'm here. Ah, like it's in Facebook that you do with iPhone, okay. Yeah, Facebook. welcome to Facebook. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, Foursquare is interesting because um, they were kind of one of the first uh, services of this kind that um, included a lot of different game elements to encourage users to use the service. Because you know, when you tell people about Foursquare, the next question is, okay, why should I do this? Why should I bother to check in and tell my friends where, where I am? Uh, well, Foursquare has some nice initiatives for you to do this. Uh, one of the things is that uh, when you check in, you're awarded um, some a score um, regarding you know, whether this is your first check-in at a place, whether I don't know, it's the first check-in at the school, yeah, good for you, you're getting your dedication. Um, so you're getting scored and you can also unlock special badges uh, as you check in regularly. So that's my quite small collection of badges. It's still small, I, I have to try hard to get more badges. Um, so for instance, if you use Foursquare uh, long enough, you have uh, enough check-ins, you get a special check-in. Yeah, good user, good user, we'll give you a badge. If you check in, um, I don't know, this badge here with the water, it's an interesting one, uh, it's called Swimmy's Badge. I had to check in, I don't know, a couple of times at a place near the water. So when I did that, Foursquare awarded me a special 
uh, swimming badge also <laughs> warned me not to drown. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, it's also a lot of fun. It's uh, adding a lot of um, basic um, game elements, game mechanics into the service. Um, and then you can also become a mayor of a place. So if you're a regular at a local bar, you can become the mayor of the bar. And one smart thing Foursquare is doing now is enabling companies, uh, place owners, to provide specials for their customers. Uh, for instance, Starbucks had a special. If you became a mayor of one of their uh, coffee places, you could get a discount. Um, so, you know, people can get a lot of different things uh, by checking in. Uh, when I checked in today, I also checked out the um, local specials around here and saw that uh, uh, the gas stations, uh, one of the gas stations is off, will uh, be giving away a t-shirt to some of their mayors. So, you know, you're encouraged to check in regularly to become a mayor and get something. Um, so it's, you know, an interesting proposition world for users because, you know, you can really, um, for instance, see uh, where your friends are and see they're nearby. Um, but you can also get interesting stuff for it and companies uh, or places owners can get uh, new, new ways of promotion. Uh, and yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Facebook because Foursquare was one of the per first location services uh, and you can tell what they're doing is important uh, because Facebook is now yelling, me too, I'm wanting the game as well. Um, they have their own location uh, service similar to Foursquare called Facebook Places. Works in the same way with the app, you have uh, the Places tab, you go there, find a place, you check in, and when you check in, uh, the story appear appears in your newsfeed, so your friends uh, know where you are. And in Facebook, you can even easily check your Facebook friends with you. So we're at the concert, this place, this and this friends are with me right now. Again, you can add photos, and so on. Very, very similar uh, to Foursquare, although Facebook doesn't have badges and mm. achievements, unfortunately. But they uh, are already testing uh, deals related to um, this service. Uh, currently, I think they only have a few places in the States, but um, as with any Facebook product, we can expect this to go worldwide. So um, also on Facebook, you'll be able to give your customers some incentive for checking in. Mm -hmm. uh, and Facebook is really interesting because a lot of local places already have their pages. So as a I don't know, a coffee shop owner, you already have your page on Facebook uh, where you connect with your fans. Uh, and now you know, you can just add your address and your users can check in at your place and all their friends see where you are. So it's a very interesting service. Um, and again, you know, we cannot talk about anything mobile without Google being somewhere uh, in the game as well. Um, they're not really Big on all the whole check-in thing, they have much more humble, so to say, ambitions. They just want to take over your wallet. Um, so they want you know, to tie in your credit cards to your Google account, and then they'll enable you to uh, pay for things with your mobile phone. Also, they'll be giving you some offers similar to uh, those you already um, saw on Foursquare, but a bit different. And also, um, they're also planning to collect all your loyalty cards for different stores. So you all know, we probably all have a whole bunch of loyalty cards for different stores. Well, Google wants everything to be tied to your uh, Google wallet and Google offers account. Um, and of course, you know, offers, deals, and everything, there's a really interesting potential for revenue here. Uh, you know, I'm not saying Google is making tons of money already or Foursquare, because they're not, but there is potential, so there's something to keep in mind. Now, here, an interesting thing you can note from the slide is that Google Wallet wa works with NFC payments. And uh, you may be wondering, NFC what? Um, NFC is a kind of relatively new technology. Often, um, it's compared to Bluetooth, but it works on a shorter range, and it's faster. 
So as you know, Bluetooth can connect devices, um, I don't know, even 100 meters, 200 meters, um, and it allows you to exchange files and so on. Um, NFC can do that, but it works really on a short range. So you have to have two devices on a short range, and then you can read exchange content, you can even pay as terminals. Uh, for instance, MasterCard already has NFC um, chips in some of their credit cards. So um, that's already in use. Um, and there are also different fun use cases. For instance, uh, if you know the game Angry Birds, uh, they're also uh, developing a special version called Angry Birds Magic that works heavily with NFC. And basically, um, you'll have the sort of things where, where you'll have to find a friend with the same game and you'll touch your phone and you can both get extra content for uh, touching your phones. Oh. Or you can unlock extras at special locations. Um, I think they were ha having some sort of treasure hunt, so you have to discover their, uh, you have to go to a magic location and then you can uh, use NFC to get some extra content. Uh, the problem with NFC is that um, it's not supported by, by a lot of phones yet. Um, so Google Nexus S, their uh, Android phone has it, some Samsung phones, Nokia phones, but it's not mainstream yet. So it's kind of a really new technology that we probably won't be seeing a lot this year yet, but it might be big in the coming years. Um, to give you a better uh, idea of how NFC really works, some additional use cases, I suggest we take a look at um, a short video um, from Google about how NFC works on uh, their Google Nexus phone. One of the advantages is, as you saw in the video, it's really fast. You know, it's not like Bluetooth when you have to sing and pair and take stages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you probably all know that. Uh, this is really fast, it's instant, and uh, you just have to be in close uh, Oh, no. <laughs> okay, so um, there's a lot of many, many other interesting things going on in the uh, location area. So we don't have time to go through all of them. So what we did here is uh, collected a lot of different articles that you can uh, uh, read on your own. If you're interesting, interested in uh, this kind of things a bit more, um, there are things like, I don't know, um, a lot of really cool mobile ma marketing campaigns that are using location, um, QR codes are also an interesting thing, augmented reality, group buying, novel commerce, so um, really a lot of different technologies, approaches, um, and also social networking tools that are based around location uh, are also emerging right now and um, we almost get a new one every day so um, I also suggest you take a look at this. but you might not be quite sure what the whole thing is about. So basically the cloud is the project, you know, to simplify it, it will make our lives better, better because it will help us to keep all our devices synchronized uh, and give us easy access to all our data uh, and files uh, wherever we are. And um, it will kind of compensate for some of our basic human flaws uh, mainly our laziness to back up uh, things and um, we're usually also really bad at managing files and remembering 
to send our self files so we can access them later. Um, so the cloud is a really um, a system of service, um, servers that are online that help uh, keep all our devices from smartphones to laptops, uh, desktop computers, tablets in sync. Um, let's take a look at some of um, sample services. Um, Dropbox, of course, is uh, one of the, the services most people know about. Um, do you use Dropbox? Yes. Mm. Okay, so pardon the fourth word. So basically, Dropbox is a big virtual box that lives in the cloud and you just dump files into it, either from your desktop com computer or mobile phone, and then you can access those files anywhere. Um, so it really makes syncing files, uh, backing up, uh, this kind of things easier. Uh, and I think one of the um, important things for the success of Dropbox is that they also provide uh, full feature mobile apps that also have offline access. So it's really easy to get to your files uh, if you store them uh, in your Dropbox folders in the cloud. And you can also, of course, share them with other people so you can collaborate on projects um, and so on. Uh, but of course, Dropbox is mainly uh, for files and so on. Uh, and there are other really interesting services that are also uh, being developed right now. For instance, uh, Google Music, um, still in beta, of course, US only for now. Uh, but it's an interesting service from Google that um, provides access to your music library, library from anywhere. And I suggest you take a look at a short video. really different to how we do things today um, when we have to think about where to save our files, uh, remember to keep our iPods in sync. So it's you can use your content anywhere, whether you're on a smartphone, tablet, um, at home, any computer, and it's all instant. That's important. You now you don't really have to think about it. And it's another great example of just the technology getting out of the way. And you do your, your own stuff, you know, you create playlists, add songs, whatever you want. You don't have to think about what will happen. The cloud will take care of it all. <laughs> um, another interesting service that's also that's, uh, developed by Apple, it's coming to their next major update uh, of iOS, the operating system that, that runs on iPhones and iPads. It's called the iCloud. Um, and again, as we already saw, it keeps everything in sync across all devices. Um, what's interesting with the, I, uh, with the iCloud is that uh, not only it keeps things, uh, your music, apps and books that uh, you buy, but also photos and documents are especially interesting. So if you create, I don't know, a keynote presentation on your iPad and then um, forget about it, you have it instantly on your iPhone so you can show it to a friend when you're talking about that. And it all happens without really you having to save as export and all that kind of stuff. So it's all in the background and um, as Steve Jobs said, or is promising us, uh, it just works. So you don't have to think about it, uh, service will do everything. Um, you also get um, things like automatic backup, uh, free push email, calendar and contacts, so you can really um, keep everything in sync across multiple devices. Um, and another interesting, this is completely new service from Google. Uh, I don't know if you've heard, Google has um, recently announced Google Plus. Uh, their attempt, yet another attempt of at uh, making a social network work. Um, some call it Facebook killer, I'm not sure it's, right now it's somewhere between Facebook and Twitter, to be honest. Uh, but one of the best features, well, one of the features that most people really love about Google Plus is the instant upload uh, feature. Uh, right now it works on Android phones. It, whenever you take a photo with your Android phone, it instantly appears on your Google Plus instantly, and when I say instantly, 
I really mean instantly. It's not, you know, you're pressing the button saying upload. You just take your photo and before, you know, it can blink, the photo is already in the cloud uh, with Google. And then, of course, you can choose to share it with your friends and so on. Um, but it's, it's a really seamless experience. You just take the photo and the service takes care you know, of all the uploading and making sure it's in the right place. Um, so I think the cloud, you know, it's a, a really important uh, trend and we'll be seeing more of this kind of services uh, in the coming years. Because right now, you know, it still all sounds like science fiction. You know, we're all a bit skeptical. Is this going to work? How does it work? But I think, I don't know, in about five years, we'll just all be used, used to the cloud doing all the work for us that, you know, we want to notice it. It will be perfectly normal to do something on, I don't know, your iPads, forget about it. You, go, you get home and you have all your content already there. Uh, without you having to do anything. So um, that's it for our trends. Um, so we saw five trends. First, how um, mobile learning or learning is changing because um, or thanks to mobile devices um, and it's becoming more magical, more physical, um, easier to use. Then we look at, looked at the trends of apps and app stores and how um, developers are making money from that um, and how apps uh, and mobile devices are influencing websites, desktops. Uh, we just threw, took a really brief peek at some of the location services that are uh, hot right now and uh, at the cloud. But uh, before I finish, I'd just like to give you one final piece of advice. And you know, we, we talked a lot about you know, fancy technology and all that, but the most important trend I think we're seeing is that the experience, the user experience is coming to the front. It's not about the pixels, it's not about the gigahertz, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's really about the experience and how mobile devices make us feel and how they enable us to interact with the content and the world around us. So it's the experience that's key. Uh, Apple, of course, is one company that's, that always knew that experience is key, uh, but I'm glad that uh, other companies are finally realizing that as well and that the really end user experience is coming to the front. Um.